Dear Lord, let me experience your suffering on the cross and let me experience the love in your heart which allowed you to endure the cross. Dear Lord, what's the noise? What's the, is someone here? No, you cannot. It's not fair. Are you here? Yes. yes. yes you're here. Yes. He lets you in. Yes. I, they don't listen to you. I, mean, I did not want you to see me like this. No, excuse me. I, I, so I did not want you to see me like this. For the last two, three years, my eyes have been so bad. The pain, the light. Every time in the light, it hurts, the pain. So I have to cover them or be in the dark space. Are you there? Yes. Yeah, wave your hands. Yes, I can see you now. Yes, yes, yes. I'm so sorry. I did not want you to see me like this. I'm Francesco. They call me Father Francesco. Sometimes they call me Brother Francesco. Sometimes they say, you poverello, the poor man, yes? But you know what I call myself? The new crazy man from Azizi. <laughs> yes, yes, because no, no, I say the new because there had to be a crazy man before me, yes? Uh -huh. yeah. But I tell you about my eyes. My eyes, since I come back from Egypt, they have been so bad, the pain. That uh, I originally I learned from Saint Paul. Do you know Saint Paul? Do you read the Bible? Yeah. Yes. Two of you. Yes, that is very good. <laughs> yes. I, when you read the Bible, you learn about Saint Paul. He had a thorn. Do you know this? Mm -hmm. yes. And the thorn was so painful. He prayed to God. He said, "God, take away the pain." But then, when God did not take away the pain, he prayed to God that he might keep it. He said, then, when I feel the pain, I will think of you. I will remember the pain and suffering you suffered for me on the cross. So I did what Paul did. I prayed to God, take away the pain in my eyes. Dear God, take away it. But when he did not, I prayed to God that I could keep it. So I would be reminded of his pain, his suffering for me. Yes? But my brothers, they did not care what I pray. <laughs> so they take me to the physician. And the physician, he cauterized, burned, yes, from my eye to my jaw. And then, when that did not get rid of the pain, they took the needles and they punctured both of my eardrums. Oh. Yes. And I said to them, this, you're hurting me more. Yeah. And they say, well, they are just practicing the medicine. <laughs> I said, well, they should practice on someone other than me, yes. I am so free. My brothers do not want me to meet with you. They think I am too tired. But I want to. This may be my last assembly, but I am so pleased that God has brought us together today. Yes? Yes. Whenever I think of my eyes, I always think of Brother Leo. Do you know Brother Leo? Yeah, he is a friend of mine from the time we were living in sin. And then I remember one time he came to me. He said, Francesco, I want to meet a girl. He said, you know all the girls. See, when I was living in sin, I was known for wine and women and song, yes? And so he says to me, Francesco, I really would like to meet a girl. Would you arrange for me to meet a girl? And I said to him, uh, Leo, it is not my job to find the girl for you. You should find your own. But then I looked at him again. <laughs> I said, no, maybe I should help you. <laughs> So I said to him, I said, Leo, I have someone for you. And he said, oh, Francesco, that's good. Yes, it is. Would you tell me about her, Francesco? I said, well, I, uh, she don't look so good. But, but, but she is very, very nice. And Leo said to me, well, Francesco, I will trust you. Yes. And so I arranged for them to meet. And after they met, the next day, Leo comes to me, he's all angry. He said, Francesco, what on earth were you thinking? He said, I am walking with this girl, and she walks into a wall. I walk her with, she falls down onto the ground. I pick her up, we walk further, she trips on the stone. And he says, this girl, Francesca, is a blind. And I said, well, I told you she don't look so good. <laughs> 
you like Francesco's humor, yes? <laughs> well, I am known. I am known for humor. I, when I was growing up, I was known for for telling the jokes, having the fun, and singing. My father, Pietro de Bernardoni, you know him. He owns most of the homes and buildings here in Assisi. He owns the fabric business, and he is loaning the money to everyone. That's my father. And my mother, Pika, who is from France, taught me the French love songs. And I was known for singing the French love songs. In fact, all of my friends, did you know they love to be with me? We would get together, we would laugh, we would sing, we would dance, we would play, we would do the wine, the women, and the song. And did you know they voted for me? They voted for me to be the king of the revelers. Yes, because I love the wine, the women, the song, the dance, the sex. I love this. And I bought all the meals and all the wine. <laughs> I'll tell you something. You buy the food and the wine, they'll vote you in the end. Yeah. So, and, and my father, he never minded my spending money on the wine and the women and the song. Did you know this? You see, my father, my father always looked for joy in things, in money, in possessions. My father never found the joy. I found joy in complete poverty, yes? That's where I found joy, was in complete poverty. And so I have a seven, I'm one of seven brothers and sisters, seven children. And uh, I want you to know that uh, we have an uncle, that's my father's brother. Do you and your family have one member of your family that's the funny one? That whenever you have the gathering of the family, he is the one who is there to tell the jokes. Do you have one like this? That makes everyone to laugh. Do you know in your families? You have to nod. I cannot see well. <laughs> yes, 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 yeah. Well, this was my uncle, my father's brother. He was always the one with, in fact, I told him we had seven children. The Bergamo family, they live maybe two, three streets from where I grew up. They had ten children. And my uncle, everyone has babies in Assisi. Yes, no, it's like, oh, I don't know what to do today. Ah, let's have another baby. I <laughs> and so, this is the way it is. So always there are babies here in Assisi. With the Bergamo family, my uncle is telling us at a gathering of our family, he says they have ten children. Nine of them, brown hair, brown eyes. One, blonde hair, blue eyes. <laughs> And Mr. Bergamo said to Mrs. Bergamo, we have the ten children, nine, brown hair, brown eyes, one, blonde hair, blue eyes, you have to tell me, it's not my child. And Mrs. Bergamo, she looks at him, she says, it's your child. <laughs> Many years go by, Mrs. Bergamo is on her deathbed, she is about to die. Mr. Bergamo, he goes to her and says, you are about to die. You are about to stand before God. You're about to stand before the God who created you. You cannot go before God with a lie in your heart. He said to his wife, we have ten children. Nine brown hair, brown eyes, one blonde hair, blue eyes. You must tell me the truth. It's not my child. But she looked up at him from her bed. This is my uncle telling this story. Yeah? Looked up from her bed and she said, you are right. We do have ten children. Nine, the brown hair, brown eyes. One, the blonde hair, blue eyes. It's yours. <laughs> yeah. The other nine, no. <laughs> my mother, my mother was angry. My mother said, don't listen to your uncle. Don't listen to your uncle. I know the Bergamos. All ten are their children, she says to me. So do you have a relative like this? Always do the embarrassing things. So we have children here. We have children, yes? Do you go to school? Do you, do you like it? Do you? No, I never liked school. I never, did you know that? I never wanted to go to school. I would leave. I, would, I never learned the Latin. I never learned very well to read. I would always leave school. What did I leave to do? I went to play. I always wanted to play. All my life I wanted to play, to, to not study, but to play. And this is how I live my life, yes? And in fact, when we were older, 
one of the things we played was we played as if we were knights. We played as if we were one of the knights of the round table or one of the uh, Charlemagne's paladins. We were always one of the knights. And I will get up and I will show you. I must tell you this. I was always the best dressed of the knights because my father owned the fabric business. So I would take the fabric and I was always dressing up as the best knight. And I would wear the most colorful outfits. And we would slay the dragons. We would save the women from distress. We were the best knights. But then one day, I was called to war. I am 19 years of age. I was called to go fight in the war in Perugia, the north. It was two, three days out, I realized I don't like war. The only thing I liked about war was the costume. I see my friends on the ground, they are bloody, there are pieces of their body that have been severed and cut in their own blood they are laying there. And after two, three weeks I was arrested, did you know this? I was arrested. I was held in a cell for one year. They were waiting for my father to pay the ransom. <laughs> yeah. I was told that he could pay it after the first day. <laughs> yeah, he made me wait in that cell for one full year. And then he paid the rent. He wanted to teach me a, a lesson, yes? Well, I learned something. I learned I don't like war. I don't ever want to go to war again. And I learned that I get sick when I am locked up in a small room. I developed a very bad for one year after I was in bed and I was sick. Well. The next time I was called to war was maybe two years later. And at this time in the south towards Spalero. And I was called to go to war. And I dressed up again. And I was the best looking of the knights. But my heart was not there. I did not want to go to fight. And it was on the first day out. I had a vision. And in my vision, I heard God speak to me and say, Do you want to serve the king or do you want to serve the servant? And when I heard that, I knew somehow God was speaking to me. So I left my men and I went back. They called me a deserter. They went to find me. That chased after me. Well, I went and I went and every day for one year I prayed. I would go to the valley outside the walls and I would go to this place called San Damiano. It's a small chapel. It's in ruins. And every day I would pray to God, God, why are you calling me? What are you calling me to do, Lord? I want to know what you are calling me to do. Well, one day when I was praying in San Damiano on the crucifix, I saw Jesus there on that crucifix. And he looked straight at me. And he spoke to me. He spoke to my heart. And he said to me this, he said, Francesco, you must rebuild my church. Jesus from the crucifix speaks to me, Francesco, you must rebuild my church. Three times he says it, Francesco, rebuild my church. You can see it is in ruins. Well, when I heard that, I thought he meant rebuild San Damiano. So I start, I went and I got the rocks, the stones, I was bringing them in, putting them up onto the walls, getting more stones, more rocks put onto the walls. But then I ran out of the stones, the rocks. So I went to my father's house and I took money. And then I took a lot of the fabric. And I took the fabric, I sold it to get the money. And with the money, I went, I bought more bricks, more stones to be used to rebuild the church. Well, when my father found out about this, he was very angry. And he went to the bishop. And I said to the bishop of Assisi, he says, My son is stealing from me. My son is taking my money, he is taking my fabric and selling it. He is stealing from me, he is taking the money to rebuild that old chapel. Well, the bishop calls us together in the piazza outside the bishop's home. And we are there in the piazza here in Assisi. And my, the bishop comes to me, my father is there, my mother, my brothers, sisters, many other people. And the bishop says, Francesco, your father says you are stealing his money. And then you are taking that to rebuild a church. Is this right? I said, yes, Bishop, that is true. And the Bishop looks at me and he says, well, Francesco, you cannot rebuild the church 
with the stolen money. You must give the money back to your father. So when I said that, I went over to my father and I took off all of my clothes. I am standing there with nothing on in the pit. And I say to my father, these are yours. I don't want anything from you. You are no longer my father. From this day on, I have only one father. Our father, who art in heaven. And I turned and I started to walk out the piazza. Well, the bishop was bothered that I had nothing on. So he came over, he put a robe on me, his bishop's cloak, and I walked out of the walls of Assisi and into the valley. And then, a short time, I see a beggar. I go to him and I say to him, Would you like this wonderful bishop's cloak? I will trade you for your beggar's wear. And he said yes. And we traded. I decide from that moment, the rest of my life, I was going to dress only as a beggar. Yes? Did you know that that very day, I was a mug? Oh. I was a mug. I was beaten, they stole everything from me, and I was left there naked in the snow to die. And I thought to myself, all of my life, I have lived in Assisi with a lot of money, always the finest clothing, always with a purse that had the money, and never once was I mugged. Now I have nothing, and they mug me. I'm thinking the criminals in Assisi are not the brightest of criminals, yeah? <laughs> Well, I began to spend my time rebuilding churches. I rebuilt San Damiano. I rebuilt the Holy Angels. I, re I rebuilt San Pietro. And many other brothers were starting to follow me. And we started to stay in a home. It's a house that w someone was loaning to us. Do you know he told us to leave after a few months? Do you know why he kicked me and my brothers out? You won't believe this. He wanted to make room for his mule. <laughs> yes, he told us to leave so he could move in the mule. And I remember praying that night, Dear God, I hope that Brother Mule enjoys the house as much as we did. Yes? <laughs> well, I began to preach. And uh, the bishop came to me and he said, Francesco, you cannot preach without the permission of a Rome. You are not ordained. You know I was never ordained. Not a brother, not a priest, not a deacon. I was never ordained. And, and the bishop says, you must get the permission from Rome before you can preach. So I said, fine, I will go to Rome and see the Pope. <laughs> That's why they call me the crazy man. I mean, what kind of a crazy man thinks that a, a beggar can just go to Rome and uh, see the Pope? So, but I did. I gathered some brothers together. Let us go to Rome and visit with the Pope. So we went. I found a friend of mine from the days I was living in sin, and I said to him, I would like to meet with the Pope. And my friend says to me, the Pope, he will not meet with you. I said, just try to meet as a meeting for me with the Pope. I said, he comes back to me, it's arranged. So, he takes us all into the, the church. This is the most beautiful church. St. John Lateran, the most gorgeous, beautiful church I had ever seen. And we are brought in, and I am there with a few of my brothers, and here comes Pope, Pope Innocent III, the most powerful of all the popes there ever was, I think. Do you know he's the one that changed the name of the Pope from successor of Peter to the vicar of Christ? There is no ego here, yes? And so, I am there, and here is Pope Innocent III coming to me. And do you know what he said to me? He said, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? You're a beggar. What are you doing in here? You must leave. You must leave. And I turned and I walked away. And do you know when I walked out of that church, the beautiful St. John Letter and the most beautiful church I had ever seen, when I walked out, I saw across the street a stand of a beggars. And I went over and I stood with them and I begged you know that I felt closer to God when I begged with, the, with those beggars than when I was standing in that great church of St. John of Lateran. Well, the next day we were preparing to go back to Assisi. And my friend came to me and he says, you cannot leave yet. The Holy Father, he wants to meet with you. I said, yes, yes, I heard that yesterday. No, no, no. No, he is saying he really wants to meet with you. And I looked up and I said, there is a God. <laughs> So we went back into the church of St. John Lateran, and right in front of us was Pope Innocent III. 
And he came right to me and he looked me into the eyes and he said, I am so sorry I sent you away yesterday. The Pope says to me, last night I had a vision. And in my vision I saw you, Francesco. I saw a beggar. And the beggar was holding up the church. You, Francesco, the beggar. I say, Holy Father, all we want to do is preach and teach the world of Jesus. So, he gave us permission to preach. Yeah. And then he gave me the haircut. <laughs> what do you think? Do you know why it is this shape? Most people don't know. Would anyone like to know? It is to represent the crown of thorns that Jesus wore. So that when people would see us, they would think of Jesus with that crown of thorns, and we would remind ourselves each day that we are wearing the thorns of Jesus, yes? Well, we went back to, to Assisi and we would preach. And I found I was not that good at it. <laughs> so I went to uh, Bishop Guido and I said, Bishop, I said, can you teach me how to be a better preacher? And he said to me, well, I will tell you what I told an older priest who came to ask the same question. An old priest comes to me, the bishop says, and he said, how can I preach better? And I told him, I'll tell you what I do. And the bishop says, I told the old priest, I first go up to the pulpit and I say, friends, I've got a secret. I'm not afraid of my secret. He says, I'm in love with a beautiful woman. Mary, the mother of God. And the bishop says to me, the old priest was so happy. He said, yes, bishop, you start with a story. How yeah, wonderful. So the bishop tells me the old priest goes back to his church. And he goes up to the pulpit on the first Sunday back. And he says, friends, he says, the bishop has a secret. <laughs> the bishop's not afraid of his secret. The bishop's in love with a beautiful woman. But for the life of me, I cannot remember her name. <laughs> huh? Like the uh, humor of Francesco. <laughs> well, we would preach to anyone who would listen about Jesus. And we wanted to know, and I wanted people to know who Jesus was. And uh, one day I was on the outside and there was a, 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 a rabbit. And I saw a dog see the rabbit. Do you ever notice when a dog sees a rabbit? Yes, the, t the ears they go out, yes? The tail it wags. And then the dog starts to chase after the rabbit, yes? Yeah? And if there are other dogs, they hear this, they start to bark, and they, hear, and they start to, pretty soon you can have six, seven, eight of the dogs all chasing after Brother Rabbit. Am I right? Yeah. Yes. But what is interesting, the first dogs to quit and go home were the last ones to join in. <laughs> and the second to the last. Do you know which dog remains? The first. The first. Do you know why? No. It's the only one that actually saw the rabbit. Ah. <laughs> All the rest of them just got tied up and caught up in the excitement. You say you believe in Jesus, yes? Yeah. Do you really know Jesus in your heart? Yes. Do you see him in your life? Do you live your life for him? You see, I had a conversion. I lived in sin and then I was changed. Paul had his Damascus experience. Some people think you have one moment that changes everything, yes? For me, I had many moments. Do you know the story of the woman at the well? Jesus comes to her when she is all alone. She is all alone because she is trying to avoid everyone else, yes? And Jesus begins to talk to her. And first she sees Jesus as what? A foreigner. You're not from around here, she says to him. And then they talk longer. And then she sees that he is very polite to her, and most people are not. So she calls him a gentleman. And then they talk longer. She gets to know Jesus more. And then she sees him as a prophet, because he knows her lifestyle, that she is not living a proper lifestyle. And then she sees him, the fourth step for her was seeing him as Messiah. 
And when she sees him as the Messiah, the scripture says, she left her water jug behind and she went to meet the people in the town that she was trying to avoid. You see, when you come to Jesus, your whole life, it changes. You become different, yes? What it means when the scripture says she left her water jug behind, it means she left her old ways behind. She became a new person in Christ. And the fifth step of her conversion, after she opened herself with her friends, all these people she was trying to avoid, they came to realize Jesus was the Savior of the world. Five steps for her conversion. I had many steps. My first was when I was young, working for my father. A beggar came in, wanted a, a, a handout, wanted a donation. I turned my back on him, and I'm doing something else. I turn around, I'm feeling bad, because he asked for the donation in the name of Jesus. I turn around, he is not there. I go look for him. I take money and fabric, I go look for him, I find the beggar on the street. I say to him, I am so sorry you have begged in the name of Jesus. Here is money, here is fabric. I remember I turned, and when I turned back, he was gone. I think back now and think that was one time that God was speaking to me, yes? Another time was when I had the vision when I was going to war. And God said, do you want to serve the king or do you want to serve the servant? Another time was at San Damiano when I was there and Jesus spoke to me from the crucifix. But do you know what my moment was? When I finally accepted and realized that Jesus was calling to me? One day I was in the valley, and in the valley there were lepers. And you know how the lepers, when they are around, they have to hit the sticks together or ring the bell. So you know they are there, yes? All of my life, I hate lepers. I could not stand to even think of them. And when I heard the sticks or the bell, I would run. I would run streets away to avoid them. They made me sick to my stomach to even think of the lepers. But this day, I was in the valley, I heard of sticks, and for some reason I was moved to go to them. And I walked straight to the beggars, or the lepers, and instead of being sick, I saw their faces and I saw Jesus in their faces. And you know I embraced them and I did mercy unto them. And that very moment I knew that I wasn't changed. I was a new person, a new creature in Christ. Yes? So, more and more men were coming together to follow in my footsteps to help me build the churches. And so I formed what you call an order, yes? Do you know what I named it? Franciscans. Franciscans. Do I look like the person with an ego would name it after myself? No, 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 no. I know most people that think that, but no, do you know, no one knows what I named it. No. Ah, I named it the Friars Minor. You see, in our day, there are two kinds of people. Mayores, minores. Mayores, the ones with everything. They have the money, the property. My father was a mayores, yeah? And then the minores have nothing. And friar, from the French, frère means brother. So I named us friars, my, the brothers with nothing. <laughs> and that's what I named us. And, and so more and more people were coming to join the order. And I was telling them we have the rules. And the rules are we will live in poverty, we will live in chastity, we will live in obedience. We are going to live by these rules as we come together. And I heard the preaching on the Feast of St. Matthew. It said that Jesus says that we are to go out two by two with, with no sandal, no walking stick, and one cloak, and no money. And Jesus was sending us as the sheep unto the wolves. And I decide I am going to live my life as Jesus has asked us to do. And then I heard the Bible story of the rich man who goes to Jesus, say, how do I get to heaven? And Jesus said to him, well, you must follow the commandments. And the rich man says, well, I do that. He says, well, then you must do this. He said, I do that. He said, then you must do that. I do that. And then Jesus said this to him. You must sell everything you have and come and follow me. And the scripture says the rich man turned away sad and left. 
I wanted to be like the man Jesus calls who said, I will give away everything and I will follow you. That's what I decided. So, there is a, a crusade I'm hearing about in Egypt. So I go to my fellow brothers. Now there are 12 or 15,000 of us at this point. And I go to my brothers and I say, I'd like to go to the crusade in Egypt. You see, I decide I don't want to go to war. I now want to be a crusader for Jesus. Do you know what crusader means? It means cross bearer. So I took the chalk and I drew a cross on the back of my beggar's clothing. And I decide I'm going to go to Egypt. So I go to my brothers. They say no. So I go to the bishop. I say, Bishop, I'd like to go to the crusade in Egypt. He said to me, no. So I went. <laughs> yes, obedience, I have a problem with that one. Yes. Now when I arrived in Egypt, there was a ceasefire. And in my mind and heart, that was God's way of saying, it is time for you to go to meet with the Muslims. So I walked with a fellow brother across the enemy lines and into the enemy territory. We were captured, we were beaten. And they kept saying to me, why are you here? Are you a spy? And I said, no, I am here to meet with the leader. I am here to meet with the Sultan Malik al Kamil, the leader of all the Muslims. And do you know, praise be to God, they took me to him. And the Sultan looks at me and said, why would you risk your life? And I say to him, because I want to tell you about Jesus. And he looked at me, the head of all the Muslims, the leader of the army, looks at me and he says, we know about Jesus. Did you know this? He said to me that Jesus is in the Quran. And I said to him, what is the Quran? <laughs> well, I don't know, I don't know. He said it is their Bible, it is their book that teaches them how to live. I said, you are telling me that Jesus, my Jesus, is in your Quran? And he said, yes. I said, is it the same Jesus? And he said, yes. I said, it's the Jesus who is the son of Joseph and Mary? He said, yes. I said, then you better know who this Jesus is. And he said to me, He's not only in the Quran, but it is Jesus, not Muhammad. It is Jesus who sits on the right hand of God on Judgment Day. I was surprised by this. So I said to the Sultan, are you telling me that on Judgment Day, the day you are standing before God, you are going to be judged by Jesus? And he said, yes. I said, then you better listen to me so I can tell you who Jesus is. Because you said Jesus is not a Jesus, a God of war. He is a God of peace. He said, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. And we talked for two or three days, and I kept talking about Jesus. He would ask questions, he would teach me, back and forth. Well, at the end of those two days, he said to me this. He said, Francesco, you have not made a Christian this day, but you have made a friend. And he gave me a gift. Well, he didn't give it. I took it. But I, <laughs> he didn't mind, I think. This. Have you seen this? This is a Russian or a Muslim prayer horn. This is a prayer horn. The Muslim people would blow this many times during the day to call the people to prayer. Have you heard of this? Oh. Yes, they blow. They go on. So I decide, we Christians, we need to pray. So I took the horn and when I arrived back into Assisi, I would go up and down the streets day and night blowing the horn, calling the Christians to prayer. And, and my brother, my own brother, would come out, he'd throw the rocks, the stones, the mud at me. And he'd say, Francesco, stop blowing the horn. You're a crazy man. Stop blowing the horn. Well, I kept blowing it because I thought Christians need to begin to pray more deeply to Jesus. Yes? Well, when I left the Sultan, I went to the Holy Land. I always wanted to go to the Holy Land. When I was sitting on the shore of Lake Genezareth, I was imagining in my head Jesus out on that water. He was preaching. He was with the disciples. And I took a stone. And I've carried this stone with me from Genezareth since I left. Every time I see it, I'm reminded that Jesus may have walked on this stone. Praise be to God, yes? Okay. 
When I arrived back, I learned that my brothers had ousted me from my own order. Yes, unbelievable, yes? Yes, that's what I thought. You see, they said we have grown to so many people that we have to expand. We have to buy homes and houses and buildings. We have to own things. And I said that our order, we are not to own things. We are to go, as Jesus said, two by two with nothing. With nothing as sheep under the wolves. And they insisted we have to, to buy things. Do you know why I say you should never own anything? A brother came to me and I said, Francesco, I would like my own Bible. And I said to him, no, you don't. And he said, no, no, Francesco, I would like... See, this Bible is not even mine. I borrowed it. I may give it back. <laughs> I said to my brother, when you have a possession, it begins to possess you. You loan your, your Bible, you loan your book, it's not long, you start wondering, when am I going to get it back? And your focus is more on the possession than it is on God. And so I would say you cannot have the possessions. Well, they were angry at me for this, and they say, you don't understand, Francesco, how much money it takes to keep you so poor, they say to me. <laughs> yes, can you imagine this? The Vatican said I had to write rules for the order. So I wrote rules, I called it the rules of 1221. And in my rules, they were very strict. The Vatican, they rejected my rules. So I wrote the rules of 1223, and they were accepted. I must tell you, I accept the rules of 1223, but I embrace the rules of 1221. <laughs> Because they are strict. The Vatican said, you cannot expect people to live like this. Well, they ousted me. They ousted me. And I also used to argue with them, saying, everyone in this order is to be equal. Not priests here and brothers here and lay here. Not men here and women here. Not uh, rich here and poor here. Everyone in this order is equal in the eyes of God. Well, they started to create the system of caste, yes? where this is better than this. And I say, this is wrong, so they ousted me. And I was very angry with them. And I went up to the side of the mountain and I began to pray. Did you ever ask yourself how I would remain in God when I was having bad times? Two things, friends and prayer. I had wonderful friends. Leo, I mentioned to you, a long, all my life friend. I, uh, Father Sylvester, the first priest to join the order, and Claire. Does anyone know of Claire? She was a wonderful, wonderful soldier in Christ with me. She came and heard me preach in the year of our Lord, 1209. In 1212, the year of our Lord, she came and she asked to join the order. So I cut her hair and welcomed her into the order. And then I sent her to a convent. And I gave her a new name. Did you know? Christina. From that day on, I always called her Christina for Christ. Because in her, I saw Jesus. I saw Jesus. I loved Claire. I loved her because she was a model for me and for all as to who is Jesus and how to serve Jesus. And I did have a love in my life. Did you know? Yes, the Donna Poverty. The Lady Poverty. All my life, once accepting the call of Jesus, I embraced my love for Lady Poverty and reached out in that. So I, the second thing is prayer. I prayed every day. Many times I would make four or five Lent every year. Did you know? Yeah. Sometimes I would pray, I would start to, to laugh. I would do the somersaults. I would start to, to cry. Once I was crying while praying, and someone, brother, came to me and I said, Why are you crying so much, Francesco? And I said, Because love is not loved. God, who is love, is not loved in our world today. Once I was walking with Pope Honorus, and we were just, and I started to dance. <laughs> The Pope is looking at me and I said, this is a crazy man. And I am just dancing there next to the Holy Father. And the Cardinals, they said, they began to cry. And someone said to the Cardinals, why do you cry? And they say, in seeing a Francis, it's the first time we've ever seen the Word made of flesh. You must be willing to pray. Monica, St. Monica, do you know her? 
She prayed for 30 years. She prayed for 30 years that her son would come back into the church. She never stopped. She never stopped praying. She never stopped believing that God would answer her prayers. 30 years she prayed. And after 30 years her son came back to the church. We all know him today as St. Augustine. Yes? Prayer, it works. And it worked for me. I was very angry and I knew I needed to forgive. I needed to forgive my father. I needed to forgive my brothers. And so the way I work through things when I need to is I preach. So I started to do the preaching on forgiveness. And once I was in this town called Gubbio. And I heard that they had a wolf that was destroying their crops and eating all of their chickens. And the town decided they're going to kill the wolf. So I said, no, you cannot kill the wolf. You must forgive the wolf. And uh, I went out to the valley, and I'm shouting up to the, to the trees, and I say, wolf, brother wolf, they're going to kill you. You must stop eating their chickens. You must stop at the destroying of their crops. They're going to kill you. Do you hear me, Mr. Wolf? Do you know I am told the wolf never, never, never came back and destroyed their chickens and their crops? That made some people say that Francesco talks to wolves. <laughs> no, no, no. I talk at wolves. If the wolf heard and understood, it was because God who created him let him understand. Yes? Yes. A lot of people wonder about the... Uh, my love for creation and all of animals. Have you heard that I talk to the birds? Yes. Yeah. Did you, would you like to know why? Yes. Yeah. Yeah? Huh. What? Because they listen. Yes, that's exactly it. I was in the piazza where my father and the bishop were, where I took off my clothes. I was there in the piazza. And I'm preaching and talking to these people about Jesus. Well, they're turning their backs and they're yawning and they're talking to each other. They're not listening to me. But... The birds were listening. And I said, well, they are creatures of God. They are creations of God every bit as much as those people. If they will listen and they won't, I will talk to the birds. So I start talking to the birds. And from that point on, people were saying, Francesco, he's crazy, he talks to the birds. No, I talk at the birds. God makes it clear to them, yes? You see... I believe so strongly that all of creation is of God. All creation. Every animal, every, every tree, every bush, every person is created by God. That God Himself breathed existence into everything. And we have a responsibility to be stewards to all things and to look for God in all of creation. That's what we're called to do. I wanted so much for people to know that the Jesus of Bethlehem, that child of Bethlehem was real. That when I was invited to speak, to preach at a Christmas Eve Mass in Greccio, I told them I will do it. But I want you to get a, a donkey. I want you to get a cow. I want you to get a woman to be Mary. I want you to get a man to be Joseph. I want you to find a newborn baby. I told you there are always newborn babies. I said, get a newborn baby, and I will tell the story of the child of Bethlehem so it is real. Because I wanted people to know this child. Yes? I'm getting tired. <laughs> Someone's laughing, but I'm tired. I, I want to say something. Um, I keep looking off to the side. I don't know if you noticed. I'm waiting for someone. I'm waiting for Brother Jacoba. Do you know Brother Jacoba? No? Brother Jacoba makes the best almond cookies. Oh. No, the best? I'm telling you, they're the best. And my brothers, they keep saying, Francesco, you're not long for this world. He says, he said, you're not going to, to live that much longer. And I said, well, if that's the case, I want some almond cookies. Mm -hmm. So I got a hold of Brother Jacoba, and I said, would you please bring me some almond cookies? I'm glad I'm living longer than they thought, because I get more cookies. <laughs> but I'm going to tell you a secret. Brother Jacoba is not a man. 
Brother Jacoba is a woman. They tell me that women cannot come this far back into the church. So I solve the problem. I call her like a man. I make her a brother, yes? Yeah. Crazy like the fox, yes? And I get my cookies. I'm going to end now with this. Three things. We must love. We must love. I remember I had a vision one time when God came to my house. And I said, Lord, what is it you would have me to do? And he looked me into the eyes and he said to me, love. Simply love. We have to start loving one another to serve God. And the only way we can love God and serve God is by serving each other, yes? Jesus said to Peter, Do you love me? Tend my sheep. Feed my lambs. Feed my sheep. He is saying that if you love me, you must be there for each other. We must love one another. Stop fighting with each other. Stop fighting with your family. Stop fighting with your friend. Love. Look for ways to love. Second, this. He said, it's peace. Peace. Find peace in your world. Be an instrument of peace for those around you. Be peace to others and have peace experience in your own life. We are called by God, as I say to the Sultan, to be peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers, Jesus said. Let us go and look for peace in our lives. And the last is joy. People say to me, Francesco, why are you so filled with joy? And I say, because I'm so filled with Jesus. I never understood the Christians, they walk around with a frown. And they're all so dour. And they don't have a smile on their face. And I say to them and to myself, how can you have a Jesus in your heart and not have joy coming out? Joy is what we're called to have in our life. That's why I have, even when I am ill, I have so much energy. Now I'm at the end of my life, they tell me. I have malaria. I have leprosy I have picked up. I have this pain in my eyes that's so bad that I can hardly take it. And I remember praying to God and saying to God, why am I experiencing all of this pain? Have I done something wrong to you? Have I failed you? Was I not a good and a faithful servant? And while I was praying, I felt the hand of God touch me. And as it touched me, when he moved away, I had the marks of Christ all over my body, my hands, my feet, and my and my lay, my feet and my side and my hands. And these these marks of Jesus were God's way of saying, "You have been a good and faithful servant, Francesco. You have lived your life in accordance with my call." I'm going to end with the same prayer I began. It's a prayer that I wrote and I pray every day. And I would like to teach it to you. It's short. Dear Lord, Dear Lord let me experience, let me experience your, suffering on the cross. your suffering on the cross. And let me experience, and let me experience the love in your heart, the love in your heart which, allowed you which allowed you to endure the cross. Dear the Conte, God be with you. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Blessings.